For those who are diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, what do you do? Is it too late for treatment? Also, what are some pressures faced if you are a person of color? Where and what are the available resources? And how can one leverage technology to make it a part of their management strategies? Welcome to People of Color in Psychology, the show that explores mental health topics specific to culture, diversity, and communities of color. I am your host, Jack Sen. Our guest today is Dr. Shauna Pollard. She is a licensed psychologist and sees clients virtually through her private practice. As both a Black and neurodivergent clinician, one of Dr. Pollard's area of specialty is working with professionals with ADHD. Additionally, Dr. Pollard leads a consultation group for BIPOC clinicians with ADHD. Dr. Pollard completed her PhD in clinical and community psychology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and began her graduate career working on a program evaluation designed to increase minority student achievement and retention in STEM careers. Prior to her private practice days, Dr. Pollard worked with the Department of Veteran Affairs and was trained in a range of treatments, including CBT and mindfulness strategies. The breadth of her experience has shaped the way she adapts evidence-based psychotherapies to integrate the role of culture into how BIPOC clinicians, especially those with ADHD, experience mental health challenges. Dr. Pollard, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, glad to be here, Jack. Tell me, how did you get into the work of psychology? So it's interesting because I took my first psychology class as a high school student. I did a dual enrollment class. I think it was the 12th grade and it just connected with me really well. Before I went to college, I was like, am I going to do psychology? Am I going to study communication, journalism? And I leaned into psychology and I've just been on board ever since. Went straight through from undergrad all the way to the PhD in psychology. What was it about psychology that was fascinating for you? I think I was just always curious about the behind the scenes, like what makes people do what they do. I mean, I think that's the same component that leads me to uh, go down the Google uh, search trap where you start off looking up one thing and you look up like 12 other things. Or, you know, after I watch a documentary, I kind of want to learn everything there is to know about it. So I think I'm always curious about what makes people tick, why people do the things that they do. And I think personally, there was something in me that I think I always felt misunderstood a little bit different. And I think I was always wanting to help and support other people who felt similarly, kind of having the instinct that like, if a person could feel understood, and feel safe to be who they were, that would really have a big impact. Great. Tell me about some of this difference that you were noticing then that drove you to get into this career. Right. Well, one of the differences, I didn't really understand it fully when I went into the career, but I was diagnosed with ADHD, I would probably say mid to late 20s. And as a kid, how that showed up is that I was always losing everything, I would always lose my purses, would always forget supplies for school. And I was really trying hard to remember things, but I just, I would always leave something to the point where my family would just be like, do you have everything? <laughs> You know, I think there was one time when I went to the airport for international trip, and I think either I was on the way or I was there and I forgot my passport, so we had to go back. So yeah, I was just always forgetting things, losing things. And then I think what I know now is that neurodivergence sometimes tend to think differently and that ADHD people specifically tend to take in a lot of information, a lot of detail. And I think as a kid, that made me nervous because I remembered a lot of things about people. I, I just noticed that I picked up on a lot more than other people and it would make me feel self-conscious. And so that makes sense when you think about 
ADHD, which is inappropriately named. It's an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so it suggests that there's a deficit of attention, whereas for most ADHDers, there actually is an overabundance of attention and you attend to all of the things, but then it's hard to concentrate perhaps on maybe specific things that other people want you to concentrate on or things that aren't very important to you or don't kind of have a pull. But when there's something you're really excited about or really passionate about, it is easy for you to concentrate on those things and you actually can concentrate at a very deep level. Thanks for clarifying that because as you were saying, it is oftentimes misunderstood and people don't make the distinction between is it a lack of attention as opposed to an overabundance of information. Tell me more about your work that you're doing. Yeah, so I am in solo practice. I've been on my own probably like 15, 16 months, but I've been in private practice. This is the year nine. And so I see clients individually for a range of things. I specialize in working with high achievers, those who have ADHD or who are struggling with depression and burnout. And then I also started running the earlier this year group for BIPOC clinicians with ADHD. And how that came to be is that I was toying with the idea of running a group for clients, for therapy clients with ADHD group. And as I was marketing and talking about it with other clinicians, I kept running into so many clinicians who were like, hmm, like I need a group like that for myself. Once I heard that a couple of times, I kind of sat with that and a colleague uh, mentioned to me, like, why don't you run a group for clinicians with ADHD? And I was like, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. And so, yeah, I'm doing several things right now. The BIPOC group with ADHD clinicians, mm -hmm. have you, can you share with us certain themes that's emerged and maybe your process of navigating and working with other clinicians? Yeah, so uh, I guess it's helpful to give a little bit of a background. So it is a consultation group. And so we're largely focusing on the administrative side of being a clinician. I put feelers out there two clinicians with ADHD to see what do people need the most help with? And the number one answer that people came back with was notes. Um, notes, 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 notes. People being behind on notes, people struggling with like what should be included in a note and that causing anxiety when it's time to write notes. Even people like thinking about how, like, do they want to store their notes in an electronic health record? Are they still writing them? It goes on and on. So notes was the number one thing. So I decided to focus more on the administrative side, doing notes, managing finances, just kind of thinking about like, actually all of the people in this past group were clinicians who have their own private practices. And so when you're in private practice, there's a lot of variable income, variable expenses, things are hard to predict. So having a way to sort of track that and bring some predictability to the uncertainty of private practice income was something I want to make sure I cover. And then the other thing was just giving people a little bit of time to talk about the experience of being a BIPOC person and having a, a diagnosis of ADHD what is that like? Maybe how is it different? One of the reasons I also started the group because I heard other clinicians saying like they didn't know any other people who had ADHD and so they felt very alone in that process. They didn't have a sense of community. There was a lot of maybe shame and stigma about always being late, always getting behind in your notes. And then I think if you're a BIPOC person, depending on where you live in your environment, you already might feel alone, like you don't have other folks from similar backgrounds to converse with and discuss cases with. And so just imagine having that perspective and then also having that shame around being ADHD because most of my, well, all of my clients were late diagnoses. I don't think, I don't, all of the folks in the group, I should say, were late diagnoses. So I don't think any of them had been diagnosed prior to adulthood. So at the same time as you're being a clinician, you're still trying to wrangle with what it means to be ADHD. And so some of the themes that came up were thinking about what sort of supports we could put into place to make people help things in the environment. Like I have a second monitor that I use that I love. Helping people think through what supports they already have in place and which ones would really benefit them to put into place. Helping people Think about the notes process. Where do they get stuck? Where are they having challenges? Setting some goals 
around things that they want to work on regarding notes, introducing people to the concept of co-working, which dovetails with what you see in the ADHD literature as body doubling. So it's the idea that having one person alongside you while you're doing an unpleasant task will make you more likely to do the task and you'll find it easier to do. So that kind of dovetails with co-working, which is just when you work together with another clinician, whether or not you guys are working on the same thing. So helping people think about like that is an option, whether it's with people in the group, or there's a, a website called Focusmate where you can go and co-work with complete strangers. That was a thing, helping people set goals around notes. And then just, you know, talking through specific issues that just come with that overlap in those identities of being a clinician, being BIPOC, all the administrative chaos that comes with being a clinician and like how you make sense of all of that. And, and I think people really appreciate it, just having a space to share some of those concerns with people who get it and in a place where everybody's coming from the same perspective. So there's not that sense of shame. You know, you can just openly talk about your struggles and ask questions. Thank you so much for sharing the details of what is covered in a group and more importantly, we're creating a space for clinicians to feel safe to talk about these issues. Yeah. As, as many clinicians, we know it's hard to ask for help ourselves. It is. Yeah. It's so hard. Oh it's, gosh. Even when you know you need help, you don't know who to ask for help or where to go. So I think one of the coolest things, I just did exit surveys recently with everyone who was in the group because we ended in February. And one of the things I was really excited by that they've continued to meet and connect with each other after the group has ended. And I think for me that that was a major win because in six weeks, you can get a lot of skills, you can make some big changes, but you're going to need a lot more support around that. So I think just building community was something that I really wanted to do. And that's something I hope to keep doing amongst ADHDers across the board. And when's your next group? The next group starts in June, the first four Fridays in June, the next Friday in July. And so it's Fridays, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard for an hour. And the fee is 525 to join the group. So and how many sessions? It's six sessions. Six. Okay. That's actually reasonable. And the other thing that you've mentioned, you also attract adult clients with ADHD and you also have some of those who are BIPOC clients. Can you share with me some of the nuances? Just thinking about this idea of being culturally aware and competent with our BIPOC clients, also the intersectionality of this identity that I have ADHD, how might you approach that? Yeah, so I think one part of it is just self-disclosure. When I was leaning into the ADHD niche a little more strongly, I met with another psychologist who's much more senior in the field and specializes in ADHD. And she told me, you know, you need to talk about your diagnosis. You need to put yourself out there. And I was like, mm, no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't think I need to do that. Right. I don't want to. I don't want therapy to be about me. And she kind of explained that, like, it's probably more important for me as a Black clinician to kind of share that diagnosis so that people feel seen, so they feel heard and they feel safe. And I'll say that ever since I started doing that, it took me a while, a while to fully implement the advice. But ever since I started doing that, I have gotten a lot of folks who are Black and have ADHD who have felt very comfortable reaching out. And they were just like, yeah, I saw what you wrote. I saw that you talked about the fact that you had ADHD and that made me want to work with you. So I think self-disclosure has been something that I have started doing a lot more. I think helping people understand why they may have not been diagnosed, because sometimes with an adult diagnosis of ADHD, it can bring multiple feelings. It can bring like relief or clarity about a diagnosis, but it can bring regret or frustration of like, how come nobody picked this up sooner? You know, my life could have been so different if I had been diagnosed as a child. And so I think helping people understand that there are larger systemic issues that play a role in why they may not have been diagnosed or why no one may have been able to pick it up in their environment. And that can help people to 
have a little more peace with some of the adult figures in their life who miss the diagnoses. I think also talking about the role of genetics in an ADHD diagnosis. So if you have it, there's probably somebody else in your family line who has it. But if you're a BIPOC person, it's highly likely that uh, never a diagnosis. So I always encourage people to kind of think back about like who else in their family might have some of those symptoms, but never interacted with a mental health professional and got diagnosed. Or sometimes people do have a family member that was diagnosed. Now, so, may I ask why that is where amongst the BIPOC clients, where maybe there hasn't been a history of the ADHD diagnosis within the family? Yeah. So when it comes to underdiagnosis, there are certainly at least two populations that are more likely to be undiagnosed. One is women and girls, and the other one are folks of color. So some of it has to do with resources. Like in some ways, the concept of ADHD as an adult diagnosis is relatively new. So a lot of professionals, people who were trained 50 years ago, I mean, it was something that was only conceptualized in children. A lot of people were looking for the hyperactivity component instead of the inattentive component. Or if you were in a, a place where there weren't adequately trained mental health professionals, or if you were sort of driven, hardworking, very capable, you're not a problem per se to anybody else. So they may not have picked up on a diagnosis. So there's a couple of reasons why people, they may not have been in settings, they may have been in schools where they may have been under-resourced. And so in those situations, only the people with the most severe issues are going to get diagnosed and not the people who are doing well academically, which is a lot of the clients I see manage to get through school fine, have careers, right? In schools, they may not have been picked up unless they were like really, really severe. Also, some people's ADHD, you might see this more in boys, might be picked up as like, behaving badly. If they're hyperactive, maybe they're getting into fights. If they have intense challenges with regulating emotions, that might come out as a physical aggression, right? So people might pick up on those things, but they might not pick up on the ADHD as the thing that is driving those factors. Looks like you are creating a space to affirm your client's experience and help them explore why they might not have been diagnosed and treated prior to adulthood. And also understanding some of the the systemic piece that's at play here that you've addressed. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And what about, say, with the BIPOC clients, anything that you would do differently, say, with more of a traditional classical approach to treatment? I think with BIPOC clients in general, I'm always weaving in the role of, and and maybe this comes from my training as a community psychologist, right, where I'm not just looking at the individual, I'm looking at the systems. And so with BIPOC clients, I'm always bringing in multiple layers of looking at the problem, right? For example, if there are racialized events going on in the media, those might be interfering with your ability to focus and it might show up differently for you. So yeah, I think the BIPOC piece is bringing in those layers of all of the contributors that might be leading to challenges with focus, challenges with concentration, as opposed to just looking at what's going on within you internally, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And then just asking about like what their experiences were like in all of those different ways, like what it's like to have ADHD. Another thing that comes up is medication. So I think that has probably shaped how I do the work a little bit differently because when you look at a lot of the literature, medication is considered the first line treatment for ADHD. What I have found is there are many BIPOC clients who are not interested in medication as an intervention. And so I had to really sit with that and think about it because sometimes that can look like in the literature that can be seen as non-compliant. Uh, I'm recommending they take a stimulant, they decline, they're non-compliant. But I think that's where I bring in some of the motivational interviewing in terms of like holding space for where they are and maybe thinking about how to meet them where they're at. And so I recognize, okay, 
a large part of my population, AAG or not, is not interested in taking medication. And so I realized I had to expand my training <laughs> to learn some alternative strategies and to, to really dive deep into like, when are the times when I need to strongly push for medication? And what are the times where, you know what, you're doing relatively okay, like let's try some other things first. And then if you're just really not getting better, we might bring you back to medication. So I'll definitely say that's a big difference I've seen. So I ended up doing like a, a integrative treatment training for other ways to manage mental health issues and challenges that don't necessarily involve medication. And so I will often, I now will say, well, medication is one option, but like we can help you with the executive function skills first. You know, you can work on your diet a little bit. You can work on getting in shape. And so what I find is when I take that approach, that actually works better because then people exhaust all the other resources and then they're like, all right, I'm ready to try medication now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, all right. And hmm. then I think I take a much more hand-holding approach to medication. I think just having worked in a hospital, being very comfortable with meds. And so I'm always like, how's your med doing? Is it appropriate? And I got additional supervision around like, what it should look like when medication is working well when you have ADHD versus when it's not. And so oftentimes with folks who have ADHD across the board is that they're not on the right dosage. I mean, you see that with all kinds of medications, right? So I'm always asking clients, is your medication working? Are you seeing a good benefit? Are you having side effects? And so that opens the door for them to be able to communicate safely with me about that. And then I will tell them, like, this is how it's going to go. So I think across the board, not just for BIPOC, but for everybody, I break it down very finely into this is what it would be like if you take meds. So you're going to go see a prescriber. The prescriber is going to give you the med. You're going to watch out for side effects. If there are side effects, let me know, let them know. And then we can always see if you're on the right medication. I will often show clients what the literature says. You know, I'll show them the data from Barclay about what medication can do for you and how it can work. So I just give them a lot of information and give them a lot of space to decide what's best for them. And so I have clients who are on various ends of that spectrum. I have some folks who, you know, have decided to take a medication and have found that it's life-changing. I have some folks who've tried it and, and just were like, eh, it's not really doing what it needs to do for me. And then I have some folks who just really aren't interested in a medication at all. And so we see how much progress we can make with just learning skills and ways to manage the ADHD. And sometimes you might have ADHD, but that might not be the primary thing you need a medication for. So some folks are fine on an antidepressant, or on a sleep medication. And so I think like I'll say that's a piece I had to tweak a lot working with BIPOC because there is a lot of resistance to medication. Yeah. Tell us about some of the challenges you went through and how you overcame them. I think for me, one of the challenges is like, I see this on both sides of the clinician as a client. When you look into the literature, I think even before I got a formal diagnosis or, or right after I dove into all the books about ADHD, all of the greats, Sparkly, Hollowell. I think there's a book that's like, you're not lazy, stupid, or crazy that I like. So I found some really great resources, but not a, not, not, I'm not even going to say not a lot, but there were none by Black people. But, and this is probably like, what, 10 years ago. There was nothing. I found a couple of things that were written by Black folks, but they were from ADHD coaches. And it was super helpful. Renee Brooks is one of them who I've had the pleasure to connect with recently. And so I think from the clinician side, you know, because when I was diagnosed, I was a clinician. And so I think from the clinician side, the books were very rich and they gave me a lot of information. They taught me a lot. I learned a lot of executive functioning skills and resources that I was able to implement immediately. But I think from the seeing myself represented piece that was not there. Of course, things have changed dramatically in those last 10 years. Social media is huge now. So I do think people have found a little more success with finding themselves represented in the resources that are out there. And so where that comes into play as a clinician, 
I might have read a book, it may have connected with me, but if I refer, what do I refer my clients to, right? Uh, because I think for many of my BIPOC clients, they're looking to see themselves in the resources that they take advantage of. And so I often don't have resources to send them to capture that challenge of being Black and ADHD. And someday I hope to make some of those, but, you know. <laughs> on busy. top of everything that you're doing. Right, all right. Yes, I have yes, a lot yes. going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say the other piece about being Black and ADHD is, is that sometimes, I think one thing I face in general as a Black clinician is there's so much need there. You know, if you think about the way the field is is set up, there are lots of mental health. There's not enough mental health professionals, period, right? There's not enough for every person that needs help. And then there's only so many Black professionals, period. And then there's only so many Black psychologists. And so I think I often have struggled with the fact that, like, I have limitations. There's only so much I can do, you know, wanting to help everybody, but also realizing that I cannot carry the world on my back, so to speak. So I I think that's a particular challenge that I've always had over the years with like setting healthy limits, with saying no, going private pay. There are more people who need help and who really reach out than I can like reasonably take on. And so, you know, there have been periods of my life where I felt a lot of guilt about that, where I've overextended myself because of that. And I think in the past couple of years, I've been able to manage that, like, there's only so much I can do. Let me just do my small piece. And hopefully it'll, you know, maybe inspire someone else who's coming up in the field to kind of pick up the mantle and go forward. But yeah, I think and, and the reason why that kind of connects with being Black and ADHD, because when you're ADHD, you have so many ideas, or I have so many ideas. I want to do so many things. I'm always working on like nine things at once, like going to all of the, signing up for all the trainings, going to all the trainings. And I often have to stop myself and say like, you cannot do all of the things. You technically can, but you cannot do them all at the same time. Like you're limited by your capacity for energy. And so I think that intersectionality of like knowing that there's a marginalized population out there who really needs your help and really needs your support and being able to do so much and wanting to do so much, having to kind of like put on the guardrails a little bit and saying, all right, like find a lane, stay in it, do a couple of things really well (laughs) at a time. And just let go. Like, you don't have to follow every exciting idea that comes up. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I suspect that when the other listeners of this podcast, some may be graduate students, and seeing you as a woman of color Mm -hmm. with ADHD, that that can inspire them. And, And I think that's the spirit of a lot of this podcast here, is to show the the beauty of our work and the commitment that we have with each other. So thank you for that. What would you recommend for clinicians who are wanting to work with ADHD clients or clinicians who are currently working with ADHD clients and they are a person of color? Yeah, so I would say the easy, the lowest hanging fruit are follow some hashtags on social media. So follow ADHD on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, and look for the professionals. And that's a good way to get some information in a passive way. There's so many podcasts out. I think Therapy for Black Girls has an episode or two about adult ADHD. I'll often direct some clients to that. There's a website called Attitude that has a lot of resources for ADHD. I think those are easy ways to get started. And then there's a bunch of books. So I lived a very Spartan life while I was in grad school. So I learned how to obtain things at low cost. So if you are, if you have access to a library, you can always get the digital access. There's Hoopla and there's Libby. And so you can use those to check out books on ADHD. 
and just kind of skim, read through them. If you have, I love to use Kindle Unlimited on the Kindle. And I think you pay a fee and you get access to a ton of books. So there's a lot of books about ADHD on Kindle Unlimited as well. So I think those are good places to start. If you're a psychologist, National Register has a couple of small trainings that you can do. And then uh, just look for CEUs, but look for CEUs that are available related to ADHD. So the resources are out there. But yeah, I think there's a lot of light learning that you can do to be supported. I'll say to tag on to that, one of the biggest complaints that I hear for potential clients, for people reaching out for therapy is that their therapist is overlooking the ADHD. They only want to treat the depression. They only want to treat the anxiety, but they like refuse to consider ADHD. And I think it's because a lot of people just don't have any training about ADHD. So I think just acknowledging that that is a gap in your training. Most of us do not get training about ADHD in adults. And so if you have a couple of clients asking you, do I have ADHD or I think I have ADHD, I think it's important for you to see what's available. And, and also you can always see consultation, right? So if you have groups that you're a part of, ask those questions in the consultation groups. And hopefully there's somebody there who can give you some support. So, And where can people find you? So I have a website. It's www.drdoctorsp, my initials, llc.com. And you'll access my website. If you can't remember that, you can just put my name into Google and the website should come up. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Shauna P, D-R-S-H-A-U-N-A-P. So come find me on the gram. Yeah. And you also have the group information on your website? Yes, I have the group information on my website. If you can't find it for some reason, you can always shoot my admin an email at admin. A-D-M-I-N at D-R-S-P-L-L-C dot com. All right, fantastic. I will also include all that information on the show notes. Great. Dr. Pollard, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. This is great. A huge thank you to our listeners. If you like what you've heard, please share and subscribe to our podcast, People of Color in Psychology.